Long Riders, YouTubers, and all you guys watching this on Travel Unlimited. And if you people don't know what's going on, we're going to start bringing you our Travel Unlimited meetings. And they'll be every thir third Wednesday. And we'll be bringing you all the guest speakers for all the Travel Unlimited meetings. At least we hope every single one of them throughout the winter. And uh, so tonight, the, tr the Trout Unlimited speakers were two game commissioners, and there's a lot of cool information, stuff I learned, so you're not going to want to miss this video, so let's get right to the meeting and listen to them talk, and thank you for being here. Again, this is one of the ones I always look forward to every year. Uh, really good discussions. Uh, people are interested in the new things that, that come through. They want to hear the updates. And I, I, I like this more than, than most of them where I have to go just get beat up all the time. But I got a, I, I got a special one here for you tonight. Uh, most all of you know me, but we have in our academy now the 31st class of cadets and they spent 30 weeks in the academy they go 10 weeks to the field with experienced officers called field training officers of which I'm one of them and then they go back to the academy for 10 weeks so I have a cadet with me who I got for the first session uh, all total he would be with me 25 days until he moves to his next officer and then his third for his assignment so when we have them at, we try to get them to experience everything. And it's not only going and looking for violations, you know, or checking hunters. It's doing these programs. And that's one of the biggest things because in this job, if you are a very good communicator, your life is a lot easier. Everyone is on the same page. And you don't have as many problems, you know. Communication is your Achilles heel. And if you stop that somehow, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice way to do it, you know, within, within the hunting and fishing communities. So, with that being said, I'm going to introduce my cadet, Bill Carr, and now you guys can grill him. Because <laughs> i got to evaluate everything he answers here. But he's going to tell you a little bit about the Academy and give you some of our updates and ask him any questions. If it's area specific and he doesn't know, I'll jump in. Thanks. Very good. Like I said, I'm uh, Bill Carr. I'm originally from Berks County. Never spent any time up this way. And uh, I'm really loving your streams up here. If only I had my fly rod with me, I uh, would try to find a way to sneak out there. I think someday you'll definitely see me back here crawling somebody's hills and hitting somebody's streams because it is it's some really pristine waterways and I hear how productive they are. You've got something special here that you don't see elsewhere in the state for sure. I've heard Penn's Creek growing up through the years, but I've never actually seen it. It is impressive. So yeah, something special, like I said. Uh, life at the training school, I'll tell you a little bit about that. Like you said, it's a 50-week program. I um, uh, got into it a little late. I'm one of the older guys, 44 years old. So it's, it's, it's uh, definitely one of the most challenging, not one of the most challenging, most rewarding, fulfilling, enjoyable things I've ever been involved with. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. If you're one of the more senior students, let me put it that way, yes. what made you decide to take that as a career path at that age? I'm curious. As, a, as an educator myself. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if maybe this is something I should say. I was never a friend of the Game Commission growing up. Okay. I was, uh, and then I started making friends. You know, actually my first encounter was with the Game Commission was uh, shooting a goose after hours. <laughs> and the guy that wrote that ticket is actually my best friend now. <laughs> and you know, I started learning more about the agency over the years and making more friends with the agency. Uh, you know, people, biologists, volunteering with different efforts that they did. And I just truly fell in love with what it was about. And uh, being an independent con <coughs> contractor the last few years, uh, prior to that, I was an environmental consultant. And it just wasn't for me. 
the private sector wasn't where I belonged. I belonged something more like dealing with the public, dealing with some biological type things and the outdoors, sportsmen. That's always where my passion was. I always helped out on various different committees, Turkey Federation, sportsmen's clubs, uh, different things within my municipality, environmental advisory council. I used to chair a lot of these committees. And uh, when I quit that job, I was just buying time to get into training school for the last six years. Because my mind was made up. I was getting in. I missed it the first time I applied, and I was hell-bent on getting in this time. They weren't going to get, they were not going to get me in there. Uh, I convinced them with my whole heart that this is what I wanted more than anything. And I just really appreciate that they give me that chance. So now I'm 32 weeks in. Got a ways to go yet, but I really look forward to a future with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I just wish I would have would have pursued it sooner. Question? Yes. Related? If someone were interested, who would they contact? Well, it starts with the civil service exam process. They're going to have a posting. They're going to actually have a class next year. Uh, there'll be about a one year lull prior to the next class because it truly is a whole year process. You'll start. There will be the release, and there will be a certain number of applicants. When I applied, the number was 600 applicants. From those 600 applicants, maybe they'll take approximately, I don't know what the true number was, but approximately half that tested high enough will go to the next phase of testing. Uh, so the first one is an examination, like you take it a computer, and it'll be written in other like uh, stuff that you've seen in Digest, uh, things that from Traparet. Uh, other little bio biological things will be worked into there. And uh, depending on how you score on that, you make it to the next test, which is an evaluation <coughs> that is oral and written. And then from that, they will take you and uh, one of the other processes is a, uh, that's where it really gets narrowed down. And then there's a full background check and a physical that you need to pass. And the physical is like so many, it was like 30 push-ups in a minute, 30 sit-ups in a minute. It doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to run so far, so fast, jump so high, stretch so far past your toes. And they have this whole long list of things you have to qualify. If you miss one, you're not going to get shot. And it was heartbreaking to see some people that missed it truly by that much. And I was just so glad because there was one thing called the Illinois Agility Test. We should have run around, figure eight, through a bunch of cones and back again. And it is so geared against tall people, I can't even tell you. Because tall people don't corner well. I can't imagine him doing it, or maybe he didn't make him do it. But I was truly compromised. I made it by like a couple seconds. And a couple people did it. I was in a tall group. I was immediately segregated. And a lot of tall guys didn't make it. So I was, I was happy. But that was the only thing that was my struggle. And then after that, you'll sit down for another uh, interview with uh, representatives, you know, seniors from the Game Commission, uh, you know, from the uh, Board of Commissioners or a few individuals, and some region directors and other people would ask me a bunch of questions, and you go for that final interview, and then from there they, just, they selected 36 candidates, and 31 at the time took the position, showed up on day one, and now we're at 29. So, yeah, and uh, the age range, we have our youngest turned 21 on the first day of training school, and our oldest is uh, 49. He's my roommate. He's working locally too, Dan Carl. You might encounter him in your travels, possibly. You can see another cadet around. Anybody else have anything else? I mean, there's been a lot of changes aside from just starting to changing. You want to hear more about the training school, or somebody's got to have something they've been wondering about. Why don't you tell them a little bit about the vast variety of subjects Oh, we are taught within the school. Well, the vast variety of subjects come down to uh, its curriculum intensive. Every day will start, of course, with an hour of PT, which doesn't sound like much, but they push you really hard in the PT process. Uh, for instance, I think when I started there, like the mile run I did, just to have some example, I was one of the last people to, to come in every time. <laughs> and uh, I was running like, like an 830 mile, something like that. And now it's under six minutes. It's like 550. So they, they push you that hard physically. Mentally, you come out of PT, your day starts. You could be in the classroom from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night, nonstop. Some really good speakers come in, teaching subjects, pretty much all things biological. You've got to have some understanding, some level of proficiency with dendrology, every single furred mammal, 
and the regulations associated with all the game animals. And uh, we get out in the field quite often. We've done, oh boy, there's <laughs> just so many things. We're trying to summarize it all up. Yeah. But uh, we've also done uh, things like uh, some of the law enforcement things, like they teach us like forensics. You know, both with like the shooting forensics, like recreating shooting scenes for things that would be like hunting related shooting incidents. We get a lot of training in that. In the unfortunate case that we're involved in something with that. And uh, also wildlife forensics, where we have to be familiar with all the anatomy, you know, for poaching cases and things of that sort. Uh, the legal stuff we get, you know, game law, civil law, criminal law, we have to be proficient in all of it because when we get into the court system, we're the ones that have to prosecute our own cases up until it, you know, leaving the magistrate and going to a civil court. So, uh, what else are we doing? Uh, shooting, we've shot, shot, never thought dreamed I would shoot so much ammunition. Like, I remember when we started, there was truly a pallet of ammunition, and we thought, we'll never shoot that. It's stacked like this table high. I'm pretty sure we finished that pallet already as a class. So we, we came in, and we weren't very good shots. Now, wow, I never thought I'd learn to shoot so well. We have excellent shooting instructors. Uh, they teach us uh, defensive tactics, teach us how to fight, defend ourselves. It's all things we have to be very proficient at. And there's a lot of things that if you don't do it, and you can't show proficiency, you don't move on. You get sent home. So it's, it's trying at times. You know, you have to do things a certain way in a certain time and be really good at it. So that's what makes it so tough. Anything else? You yes. Do you study entomology? Uh, I can't say that word. Entomology? Entomology? Yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> no, that's the one thing. We're not about the bugs. We actually don't really study the fish much either. You know, we leave that up to the Fish Commission, the DCNR guys. Personally, I, I, that's always been an interest of mine, so I have a pretty good understanding of it. Uh, I have a degree in agronomy, environmental science, and uh, minor in biology. So I've always <laughs> taken interest in all things biological. So that was the easy part for me in the training school. A lot of the stuff I can go off of pre-existing knowledge, like the trees, like I just I just know the trees, I know the things that are crawling on the ground. It's just always been a passion of mine. So my next That's question don't fit. have any relevance then. I was like, if they taught you that, did they prove your fly fishing? Oh <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. I'm still learning some of those. But I'm the guy that flipped the rocks in the stream, looking what's in there, just like you guys probably do too. You might not know what it is, but you have something in your box that looks close enough to it if you were prepared. So Yes, sir. What was the most challenging part of your training so far? Oh, the most challenging part, I would definitely say, is the game law. Uh, they call it, I've heard it called, actually by your nephew, maybe like, right? it's the big book of everything. And you're expected to know, I've never been a numbers guy, to recall the information, like when you, game law violations, the citations, uh, to recall all the language in there verbatim. Because if you're testifying, you truly do need to know that. If you're explaining it to somebody, you truly need to know it. And it is an ongoing process. I'll never have that thing entirely incorporated in my book, but every single game warden out there is has a, probably gone through, you've probably gone through several that you've destroyed because you've been looking at it so many times. They're beat to hell, they're, they got little tabs in them with all these different notes, and you know, that's the hardest thing is to get all that information incorporated in my head because it doesn't read like normal language. It's, it's, it's almost like foreign, the way, you know, how legal documents are written. So that was definitely my biggest struggle. It's, even today, I'm still struggling <coughs> to try to get my head wrapped around it and have it so I could just recall it quickly. So. Second follow-up question is more towards Dirk. Why a warden? A warden has a, this taste of being an aggressive officer, but a conservation officer is a peacemaker. Why the warden title? <clears throat> you know, it was pretty surprising, actually. Um, we've, throughout history, always been referred to as game wardens. You know, and you're a cop. You're, you're... Yeah, and the game was our ward. You know, that, that's how it, it you know, uh, uh, in the history became that. It was from the old... Uh, uh, refuge keepers, I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong in my history, Dick, but that's how it evolved. The refuge keepers were like refuge wardens, and then it evolved into the law enforcement part with game wardens. And our uh, executive director 
looked at this and said, you know, we've been called wildlife conservation officers for years, and, you know, in all the camps he had been to and, you know, everywhere across the state, people always referred to us as game birds. And he said, why are we like this so we're going to change it? And, and that's what ended up occurring. So, in addition, we were taught at the training school that it cleared up. Uh, some people are kind of confused between all the different agencies, like the BCNR, you know, the Fish Commission. This was a clear definition of what we do and what we're about. Differentiate us with the DEP and other agencies. People don't really, they're not, they don't have conservation backgrounds. They're just general citizens. They might not enjoy the things we enjoy. So it helped clear some of that up. And that's what I was told in the same week I was told that. I went to the diner back home and the guy asked me what I did. And I told him I was a game warden in training. And he looked at me, oh wow, that's really neat. Do they still have the giraffe? <laughs> and I thought to myself, did it clear up a damn thing? People are always going to be confused. <laughs> so, so yeah, he thought I was a zookeeper. So the game warden, you know, he just, it was meant something different to him. So I don't know, if whatever we change it, there's always going to be some level of the population that's going to be a little confused. Yes, that's... How broad are your enforcement powers? I was a little shocked that it was coming two years ago, and uh, game warden checked my inspection on my car. <laughs> so I know you guys cover a lot of things that the average person wouldn't think you cover. Is there anything there that surprised you? My understanding is that would have been on state game lands your car at yes, the time. Yes, it was. Yep. It's limited to that now. Okay. So all the other Title 18 enforcement stuff, we don't pull people over for expired inspections, but we would for a DUI, for instance, if that was something, because actually you can recognize the public safety interest in that. But inspection is just something that as we're patrolling on game lands, on property, it is an enforceable thing. But at your own home, if we pulled up because we were checking you out for something else, or we, we, we wouldn't do it then, of course. It would, it would be just based on the property that you were on, and that's state game lands. I mean, you, you all still have to go to court and put things to somebody. Yes. Or yes, or whatever. Yes. Yes, the burden proof, of course, is like anything. Court process. Yes. They're hunting out of season, and they shoot a bear cub, and they've got a big bear skin there, and they're trying to stretch that bear cub and <laughs> get that big skin. No, it, 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 yes, it, that's something that we do. Uh, we, would, we would go to the court and, uh, you know, we prosecute our own cases up to a certain level. At some point, it becomes the responsibility of the district attorney. And, uh, but initially, yes, we, we prosecute those cases. And you got to remember, the fines we said, a lot of them are rolling fine. Could be $100, could be $200 maximum, could be $1,500, could be zero. So <laughs> rather than just pay some arbitrary fine, a lot of times the best interest of the sportsman to go actually go in and plead their case. And it could be worse for them, it could be better, but at least they have, you know, some say in the matter. So, I guess depending on the case is something that people should probably encourage to do. It give me more practice too. Yes? Do you often cooperate with game wardens from other states? I, I have not had any involvement. I'd have to defer. In the interstate uh, Actually, it's a lot bigger than you think. Um, we've had some cases come in where, you know, there's been violations in Wyoming, Colorado, or something else, and uh, they, they just kicked some stuff to me recently where there's violations out there. The guys got back here and you know, they're looking for us to collect some evidence that they brought back, and it could be with the Lacey Act across state lines and, and things like that. So we are in contact with a lot of other agencies from other states, and if you recall, the Wildlife Violator Pact is growing larger every year where states honor other states, quote, revocation. So if someone gets caught poaching a deer here and gets revocated three years these other states are saying don't come to our state you're revocated three years you're you're going to be the same in our state so a lot of people would in the past do all these violations here and we would get them and they'd be like i don't care i'm going to new york and west virginia and new jersey and maryland they ain't doing that now jersey's the last holdout yeah that's jersey's still 
holding out. You can still go to Jersey and hunt. Hopefully that will change soon enough. Jersey. <laughs> I knew someone was going to say it. It's kind of surprising for it. It's kind of surprising <laughs> since they put the hunting ban on their black bears that they're holding out. It's, it's really surprising. I'm waiting for Governor Wolf to tell you that you can't shoot bear on state forest land. <laughs> Somebody else have something for me? What's your views on this chronic wasting? Uh, chronic wasting disease is something we've, we've spent a lot of time on. And uh, as you can see, the source of it is these uh, deer propagation facilities. A lot of that is transferred to Department of Ag, and it's finally broken the fence barrier. And you can see that we still have three. It is encouraging that one of the deer management, the, the disease management areas, was actually closed. That was disease management area one. So it is possible to clean up these areas, but it's so contingent upon people that stop feeding, stop urine, using the urine base, uh, scent attractants, uh, not moving carcasses with high risk parts outside of those areas. So if the sportsmen that are harvesting these animals are cooperating, but well, we can't be everywhere to enforce it. You can't force people to do the right thing. But you know the outreach program is there and hopefully they'll understand what we're facing because once it breaches those lines, it you know it, it can go statewide very quickly. I mean, if the agency can only do so much, it's really contingent upon the sportsman. If people don't know a lot about CWD, what it is, is uh, it's a prion disease. And these prions aren't actually viruses, they're not bacteria, they're like barely even living things. It's just a protein that's misfolded that starts replicating once it enters uh, cervids. Cervids are white-tailed deer, uh, moose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not camels, but uh, an elk, of course. So right now, the boundary is right at the elk boundary, which is a little bit, you know, concerning. But anyway, these prion diseases are spread through urine, feces, and saliva. So once they're ingested, it can be dormant in that animal for up to two years before it even shows up as anything. So that, that, that time that it's in the animal allows it to spread through the environment. And once in the landscape, it's so stable that it can survive on the ground, on a tree, someplace the deer urinated. I mean, there's some studies that say it could be up to 18 years. We haven't been studying it long enough, but it's a hard thing to kill. Uh, it's not that you can spray something on it or treat an area. Once it's there, it's there. It's very hard to eliminate. And things like where deer share like bathing areas or you know, urine, like say you put in a mock scrape, one deer can urinate in that scrape that other deer visit, you know, just the nature of deer. Now potentially they can all acquire chronic wasting disease and you wouldn't see it for another two years. And it truly is a miserable death for the deer if you've seen any of it. Uh, they just get emaciated, their ears are, their ears are like drooped down and they're just like staggering and, and really, really thin, real sickly. But there are a lot of other diseases that look just like it. The only way you could identify it is through microscopy. There's no living test for it. The only way to test for it is on a dead animal. And uh, what they take out are the lymph nodes, the pharyngeal lymph nodes located right along the jawline. And then they'll scoop out the obex, the base of the brainstem. And through a slice of that, you'll see what the prions do is once they get into like the spinal cord, the brain matter, these lymph nodes, they cause like a sponge to develop. So all those perforated holes are all these replicated proteins that just eventually just, the brain just starts, it just doesn't work because it's so just pockmarked with these spongy-like holes. And uh, we have drop-off facilities and uh, the website has a really good comprehensive map that will show where all these locations are, where the lines are, the EMAs, and where you can drop facilities are. So, uh, a little drive one second. <coughs> So what you do is if you were hunting in a deer disease management area, you remove the head of the deer, you leave your tag attached, you take the antlers out, because that part of the brain they don't need, it's just that base and those, those pharyngeal glands, double bag it and you drop it in a box. And then somebody will test it for free, it doesn't cost anything to the hunter, if your tag's on it, and then you'll get the results in uh, approximately a month, it depends on the season. It's like two weeks, two to, it could be as hard as six weeks depending on the volume because you can't really anticipate how many people are going to use these things. So it could be as much as six weeks. 
So at that time, it's your discretion whether you want to eat it. So one of the things we did earlier this week is I put together a video on GameLens 100. I was fortunate enough to, to be selected and we put together a video showing how to debone the animal without being exposed to any high-risk parts. So you're, you're not infiltrating the, uh, any of the spinal column, you're not slashing through those lymph nodes, and it's totally possible and easy to debone the whole animal right there and leave it in the field. So it's not crossing those lines. Pretty much you're just, instead of dragging and taking it to the butcher or taking it somewhere else, you're leaving with a sack of meat, with your tag attached to your sack of meat, all the high-risk parts stay right there. So it's not concentrated in the meat, so no one's from the uh, Department of Health, uh, no one's ever going to say it's safe to eat ultra safe, but it's not where the prions are concentrated, not in the meat. It's just important to not get urine on your meat, proper field dressing techniques, that was another thing we put a video on. All these things are going to be available on YouTube or through the agency website eventually. So. You know, we're working at it, but it, it's all outreach and word of mouth, talking to other sportsmen, let them know, make people aware. You know somebody who <clears throat> deer across that line. It's on you to do the right thing. Let us know, let them know. You know, let's get that deer so it's not in somebody's waste pile in the back of the yard. They throw the hide, they throw the spine back there, and now you have another pocket coming up someplace else. You know, you really, we really got to be diligent on policing this. What's the requirement? crossing lines. Let's, I live in Virginia. That's, that's, a bad, that's a state. So your requirement when you're crossing state lines is you cannot bring any high-risk parts with you. So I debone down there. You can debone down there, but I'm not familiar with the other states. I haven't researched it that much. Whether you can leave that in the field or if you need to, like proof of sex, transporting it out, maybe you need the head, maybe you need some other part to satisfy. You're really going to have to look into their regulations. Our regulations, I know. You can leave with a deboned bag of meat with your tag attached because you've processed it. Once processed, the tag stays with the meat. You don't have to leave with the head. You don't have to leave with any other parts of that deer. You can leave everything right there in the woods. So even on state game lines, it's okay. You can do it it's in, a, in a DMA or anybody, anywhere. And a lot of people don't know that. You can even do that with bears. Everybody thinks the bear, you've got to mobilize this giant 600-pound animal like we were talking about. And get a dozen guys and a giant pole and take it. You don't need to do that. You can do the same thing. And just it's our culture here in Pennsylvania where we don't do it. But you travel out west in other states. It's common practice. That's the way people process it. They come home with meat, not you know, a high full of ticks and other creatures. And they leave all that stuff out there. They don't want to deal with it. So you know, we're trying to just raise that awareness a little bit. But crossing the state lines. Back to your question. Uh, it is forbidden now. So you're not allowed to bring in these high-risk parts. So potentially, at the discretion of the officer in the situation, you come back with a whole deer, it could be your trophy deer of a lifetime. That deer could be confiscated if it came across the state lines. Virginia, New York, uh, Ohio, there's a laundry list of about 30 western states. Canada provinces are also included in here. You want to make sure when you're transporting your trophies, you're just bringing meat home. Antlers should be cleaned. It used to say no wet brain matter attached on the inside. Now it's up to some interpretation, but it's very hard to get that clean. If you're on a hunt in West Virginia for a weekend, how are you going to clean that? Well, we advise to spray a little bleach on it. But be careful. You don't want to soak it in bleach. That will denature the bone. Break it down. It turns like glass. It turns bone like glass, yellow, bleaches it out, makes it brittle. So but you can spray a little bleach solution on there and just try to get it dry. If you can boil it, even better. But you just, it's just, you just can't be bringing stuff with brain matter dripping off of it. That's, that's what we're trying to discourage. And any of the, you know, the spine, any of that stuff. So probably best to take it to a processor, or if you're, if you're familiar enough with the process, you do it yourself before you cross those state lines. One of the, <clears throat> to this, in the last couple of years, basically, if that, is ha if that had happened, you were only looking at a $100 to $200 fine. Okay, the agency is deadly serious now. Yes. So don't do it. Don't tell all your buddies. Do not do it, because if you're caught transporting over the lines, you will possibly lose your license privileges for one to three years. That's how deadly serious they are about this disease. And on top of that, there's a lot of other studies going on out there. These prions have been shown. 
to be able to be sucked up through plant roots. And there is studies going on of the possibility of jumping species barriers. So if this deer urinates in the farmer's field and these prions are getting sucked up, it, it could devastate so many things in this state. And they've even done a study where they fed tainted venison to monkeys and they came down with it. So the agency is so deadly serious about this, look on the website and make sure you get it correct to the T. Because unfortunately, we're the ones that will get sent and have to be the bad guys. Not that we want to take your trophy, number one, especially when you didn't realize it and we're taking your hunting license for a couple years, number two. We don't want to be put in that situation, so we're trying to get the word out as much as possible. Yes, sir. Switch uh, problems in the deer population. What's the status of TB uh, in Pennsylvania? It's, it's always been an ongoing monitoring thing. I actually had a photo of somebody send me one that, that they threw a friend to a friend. You know how that works. Yeah, like mountain lions. You don't know if you can believe it or not. But what's this? And I was like, that is bovine tuberculosis. You want that guy to call a biologist. And it got cycled through I don't know how many hands to get to that guy through me. That's the only time I've seen it. Uh, I thought I saw it once in a specimen, but it wasn't. It was something else. It was just some yellow pustules. Right. It, but it wasn't bovine tuberculosis. But it's something we're always monitoring for because that also is something that could spread pretty readily through the deer population, especially when in concentrated deer areas or places where people are feeding. So, I know yes. Michigan has oh. an active program, but they have a number of cases every year. It's moved into Ohio, and with all the grazing of cattle nowadays, and you know, pastured cows, and pastured milk, and things like yes. that. It's going to, you know, the question does, does it move out of the dairy herd and into deer? It, it definitely can. There's a lot of animals that are susceptible to it. It's not just deer. It's livestock and other animals. I don't know the exact list, but it is something like even potentially as a trapper or something. You open it up, you see pustules in the lungs, yellow pustules. You want to think about it. You want to call the game commission, get it to a biologist, have them necropsy it, confirm that that's what's going on so they can monitor these cases. So there hasn't been a whole lot of activity in Pennsylvania. Not that I'm aware of. It's just that little picture, that gross little picture that's in, in the digest, you know, just so people are aware of when they open up the deer that what the heck is, you know, what is it? Now you know what it is. Yeah, I, I would eat it, call us up, we'll give you another tag, take the deer away, get it tested properly. You know, you should always be wearing gloves anyway, especially with CWD and various other things. Wear gloves. It's not a tough guy thing anymore. We got to bare hand it, fight the heart, none of that for liver. You know, <laughs> those days are over. We wear gloves now. So <laughs> think about that. Yes, sir. Are the wild hog, is this the wild hog problem getting any worse? Is? My understanding, Officer Remisnyder might have a different opinion, but a lot of those incidents are just like. It's propagators. They have various different subspecies and mixes of hogs. And sometimes fence fails. Sometimes you get a little bit out. Legally now, the hunters. I think years back, I remember. I think I remember that we were allowed to shoot it. Now we're expected to just contact the agency and we take care of it. Because shooting one hog, it probably be easier for us to just go in and take, you know, assess if it's one or multiples that it, it's on us to remove them from the population as it's identified and not the hunter anymore. I was just thinking of the migration coming up eventually from West Virginia. It, anything's it's possible. It's a season now, from what I understand. Really? I was not aware of that. What is your experience of wild hogs? Basically we had, uh, and, and he's correct, it was some of these fenced areas, the tree blows down on the fence, they dig, they get out. Uh, we had a wild population in Bedford County, a small one, they set up traps out there. Hunters had a free range to shoot on site and I think that one has been eliminated. Uh, as far as this area, we had one incident up near the Allenwood game lands and that we determined we could trace it back to a farm where it got loose. And these hogs can become feral in 30 days. Yeah, and, and someone up there uh, had spotted that one and, and whacked it. So, you know, other than that, I haven't heard a lot about it. 
Yes. The waste disease. Two year gestation period in the animal? Up to. It could Up manifest to. sooner. But you typically wouldn't see it in fawns, is what I'm saying. You will see it in fawns? It's very rare to see it in fawn in six month old deer. It would be very rare. The, the, the rest of the question is is the meat safe to eat or not? At this time, there's no consumption advisory on the meat. But if it is identified with chronic wasting disease, you're going to be advised to get rid of it. And at that point, you could be issued a replacement tag to go out and harvest another deer. But keep in mind, if it is on the tail end of six weeks, you're going to get like the winter archery tag or a flintlock tag. It's not going to be that real time. Maybe technology will help us with that at some point. But right now, they're just overwhelmed You know, at the laboratories. They can only process this stuff so fast because they have to look at each one individually. So, you know, it's, I'm sure people are going to eat it. There's going to be plenty of test subjects out there. You know, we'll find out in 20 years. But we're not trying to put the fear in people that it's going to make you sick. Because a lot of people are doing a lot of things that are going to make them sick. <laughs> so, you know, you need tobacco products and other things. So, I, you know, personally, I would eat it. But I don't speak for the agency. I'm not that afraid of it. I go out west. I shoot elk. I shoot mule deer. I take them home, they're CWD positive areas, and I've eaten it for many years. So I'm not going to change the way I've been doing things because they're not monitoring. A lot of other states aren't monitoring at the level that we're doing. You know, we're going above and beyond what a lot of other states are doing because we're at the onset of this thing. We still think we have a chance to stop it. But it's going to come down to everybody participating. And that's the only way it's going to work. Has it shown up in man yet? No. We have, a, now prion disease has, it's called a, yes, Creutzfeldt Jacobs disease. So prion diseases are a disease that can occur, I think in most mammalian species, uh, can get it. But it's not very common, you don't hear about it, and it's not treatable. That's one thing I didn't mention, is prion diseases are not treatable. At some point they're always fatal. So, you know, when the deer gets it, there isn't any vaccine, there's no vet, no one's ever going to help it. It's going to die. It's just when. So it's a degenerative disease and, and it's terminal. So, but unfortunately, you know, in those two years, you know, once that deer has it, if it has offspring, they have it. It's a dead end. So it doesn't take long to figure out what's this going to do to the deer herd in Pennsylvania. It can be catastrophic. I mean, you know, we could be a lot less deer than what we have now if we don't get a handle on this thing. Yes, sir. So what are the changes for orange this year? Oh, the changes for orange. <laughs> well, I, I think it's, it's pretty much all the same as it was for last year, and there was no significant change. But coming into this week, uh, if, if you're hunting, you need to have 250 square inches, head, chest, back combined, visible 360. If you're an archery hunter, you can display it. But during the firearm season, which is Thursday to Friday, you need to be wearing it. So, uh, and then after that closes, like during the, the muzzleloader season, you're allowed to just display and get away with that. So there's a lot of confusion in that, but you got to think safe. There's guys out there with rifles that want to be wearing orange from head to toe. I read some place where they were simplifying it. <laughs> Doesn't sound like you got simplified. The simplification that you read was the picture diagrams in the digest, I think. <laughs> I think that was the simplification, you know, the caricature that's in there. Uh, the wording will definitely get you all boogered up. But if you look at the pictures and the seasons, it's simplified that way. But uh, as far as changing it uh, through regulation, now it's safety first. You know, either we can make everybody wear orange, but imagine how people would complain about that. They would think they would never shoot a deer again. So, you're trying to work with the sportsmen here, particularly the archery hunters, you so know, that are hell bent against it. Basically, what you have heard <coughs> is one of our commissioners, Charlie Fox, has looked at this and proposed simplifying the orange regulations across the state. He's hearing from all the people in his area. They're too confusing, you know, what season am I in? Wait a second, I'm duck hunting, no, I'm rabbit hunting, you know, and you could be hunting and have to change out of worms two different, three different times in one day to change the species you hunt. So this was brought up to the commissioners. They voted to look at this further. So next year you should be hearing something about how they may propose to simplify things. But since last year, nothing has changed. 
I apologize, I wasn't aware of that. So, you know. No. Define present orange. Present. Mm -hmm. What word did you use to say? Display. Oh, Display. It, Display. It, it must it, present by, by the regulatory language is 250 square inches on okay. the head, you? chest, and back combined, visible from 360 degrees. I got that much. And then you, you went on to say something more that um, archery hunters. Oh, I understand. Uh, during the regular season, like where it overlaps with small game, when the rifle season isn't open, uh, they're allowed to remove their orange, but they must display 100 inches, equivalent to baseball cap. I mean, this would satisfy, they can hang it on a branch, but they can't drop it on the ground, they can't put it behind them and sit on it. It's got to be visible 360, that 100, that, that 100 square inches. So this is about the equivalent. They also sell a band to put around a tree, which is a smarter way to do it. You wrap the tree around behind it. Excuse me? Feet. Yes, yes, exactly. And some people still want it over there, but I, I personally, I would advise keeping it closer. It's not moving. It's not scaring anything. You know, so be safe. That's that's the most important thing out there. Let other people know where you're at. If you're hiding, something bad can always happen. So be safe, Courtney Orange. Yes. What's not a virus, Grouch? Yeah, the thing I've heard about that is this is a very bad year, as you can imagine, because of all the wetness. Birds of prey. It was wet. Yes. So bad year for mosquitoes, bad year for all birds, including grouse. Um, I was at the, uh, the pheasant farm today. Pheasants are going strong. I mean, they survived the mosquitoes. But the other thing that I've heard is there is some belief now that some of the grouse are resistant. So the survivors that are out there are going to start propagating new grouse that are resistant to the West Nile. But as you know, as I know, that's going to take a long time. And I'm sure they're looking at regulation to address that. You know, possibly if the grouse numbers go down, you know, we're going to have to harvest less grouse. But right now, the season's still as it was. I don't think there was any change from last year for grouse. It's exactly the same. It started a week early this year again. But, before the rest of small game started. So, yeah, it's, it's not good for the grouse population what you're like this, of course, as you can imagine. And a lot of times, you gotta think about that. You're gonna have peaks and valleys in any population. You guys have all seen it with the blackhead and the turkey and, and things like that. Habitat's the key. Yes. We get that habitat, that population will rebound and rebound strong with a resilience to that disease. And if anybody's against like the logging and stuff that the Game Commission do, that is grouse habitat in short order. Especially some of like the aspen stands that we clear cut, let them regenerate. That's the prime habitat that the aspen that, that the, the grouse want. We have a lot of that going on in the state. So it does, like he said, it comes down to habitat. It's not just the mosquitoes. You know, we need more grouse habitat. Our forests are too mature, they're under harvested, it's all even age. It's it's not what grouse want, it's not where they're gonna thrive. So slowly, we just keep adding habitat. It's got to improve. Bear population. From what I hear, strongest ever. If you don't have a bear tag, if you don't have I a bear heard. tag. You are wrong right now. <laughs> <laughs> get a bear tag. Go out and try to shoot one because we there's need more to bears get than some ever. bear taken out of this population. In Union County, how many nuisance bears? Well. I, I guess that's a word I, I, I try tend not to use, because nuisance, you know, is a broad definition. Most of the time, it's a bear being a bear. Like we had a call today, a lady said the bear tipped her garbage can over and drug it all over the place, and you know, it's a mess. Okay, it's a bear being a bear. They are opportunistic feeders, just like any animal. A raccoon would do it. You know, there's all kinds of animals that would do that. Uh, so we, we just have such a high population, there's more and more and more incidents in human interactions. And that's where they kind of get the term nuisance because, because of that many. And I can tell you, we have quite a few living within three miles of where we sit right now. All around town, I mean, usually every other year, I'm taking one out of Bucknell University. 
uh, we, we had the mother that was living over there uh, by the Beagle Club Road. She's still there. She kicked her two cubs out this year. But, you know, everyone was seeing them getting into the garbage cans and everything else. One ran through Lewisburg for a week and we never got it. And the other one swam the river and we got that one over in uh, Milton. So there, there's just so many bear out there. And, and there, there are some trophies too. Uh, I trapped one on May 11th to weight 500 pounds this year. And he's up near the halfway dam area. And the mass crop this year, he'll be 700 come the season, for sure. I'm sure you guys have all seen the acorn production this year. It's mm -hmm. really, really good. So the bear should be out late. It should be a good harvest year for bear. If the weather cooperates, as always, guess it. It'll be raining. <laughs> what about, I, I'm, not that I hear a while, I hear conflicting reports on turkeys. You know, they're down, some say they're seeing them, others say they're not seeing any. Uh, I haven't, but I, the spring, the, the, the summer turkey count harvest, the, the, the data yeah, hasn't the, come the, back. The data didn't come back yet. Uh, if you're looking at this area, we're, we're slightly down. I mean, there's, there's no doubt, uh, everything I'm hearing, everything I'm seeing, yeah. you know, things like that. And, and again, you know, you look at the recruitment, you know, the, the biggest thing that gets those turkey poults is your cool weather with all the rain in the spring. You know, and just like he said, when did we have rain last? Yeah. So I think we're, we're down a little in the county, but it's not down to the point. You can't find them. There, there, there's still quite a few, but it is down to what we've been used to, say, five years ago, for sure. And on that note, everybody likes to play the Fisher. But the study was proven they did the gut context or gut content survey uh, of all like the roadkill fishers, the trapped ones that were turned in that were caught accidentally, and they determined that the constituent of bird material that could separate turkey from other birds it was no more so than a lot of other predators. I mean, it almost equated to you know some of the other things they found in them. You know, so I mean that was a seasonal test. It wasn't just one snapshot in time. So it, it really didn't, it wasn't like they were preying heavily on turkey as opposed to other birds. It was a very small percentile of their gut content. It was more mammalian and scavenger type stuff that was in there. That study's on the website. Uh, I'm sure that data's in there if that would interest anybody because the fisher often gets the blame for why the turkeys aren't here and not the weather like we had this spring or, or West Nile, which is affecting the grouse. It's got to be affecting the turkeys too. They're both birds. It affects, you know, all birds. Songbirds even are coming into some of the rehab centers with West Nile, so everything's everything's suffering from it. I have a neighbor with it. Oh wow! So wow, it's affecting a lot of things. Where are we at with the coyote populations? Are they pretty well stabilized? I, I I I would say they're they're stabilized. You know, you always have a predator prey relationship. Uh, you guys are very familiar with that. I, I know where I can go and sit out, and I'm going to hear the coyotes every night. And yeah, my camp. was that my, my camp? Yeah, yeah. And you're you're gonna you're gonna know where you know they're gonna be from uh, the, the hunting season and where they are. You know, and, and sometimes you, you you look at these predator prey relationships, and I I, I like to look at some of these animals because I, I think they're really cool when you hear them howl. A lot, there's two places I sit on night patrol that every time there's coyotes around me, you know, and, and how, and I, I love listening to them, but when you look at them, there's, there's a lot of benefits to this animal. People always say, you know, they take down the deer, the fawns, everything else. Well, that study with the fawns, the bear was the primary predator of the fawns, which we knew before, we just reiterated it. Coyotes are the farmer's best friend. They are the ultimate groundhog hunter. That is one of the prime source of their diets. And if you're a farmer and you don't love coyotes, you, you need to rethink, you know, wh which animal is your favorite. But also, they're cleaning up all these deer gut piles, the ones that, quote, are wounded and get away. You know, that, that is typical mother nature at her best. You know, the sick and injured, 
are basically sacrificed for the benefit of the healthy at those times. And, and coyotes are, are, are great at that. So we're, we're getting some cleaned up environment from some of these animals and sometimes you just gotta look at them in a different light. And besides that, they are a great recreational opportunity to hunt. If you ever get the opportunity to hunt them in January and get a prime coyote fur, you would just be unbelievable. Their guard hairs are six inches long. The, the softness of them, they, they just make such a beautiful tan pelt to hang over your fireplace or wood stove. And they come in like four different colors. You know, they're just beautiful. Coin up. <clears throat> yes, it happens. Coin up. That too? At least four for small They're a little smarter. Bigger. Bigger. Color faces. The color faces mm -hmm. also. Yes. And they're survivors. They're, they're here to stay. And if the habitat's right and somewhere they want to be, their dispersal the way they just are, they're just all oh, where there are coyotes today, if you shoot out every single one of them, they'd be there next year again because new ones are going to come in. They're just that great at dispersing. You know, if you get too many coyotes in the area, diseases start to manage them. As with foxes, you know, mange and things, they're susceptible to. Where was, where was the coyote 50 years ago? Mm. The, the, the coyote was always around. And we could go back into uh, game news back in the 30s and 40s where someone had harvested them, you know, and it was just the population was not high whatsoever. It was a very, very limited population. So as they keep taking hold and you have the food source in another territory, they just prolificated. And, and that's, you know, that's your, again, your predator-prey relationship. When the food source is there, it's, you know, the, the, the predator species are going to be up there, too. That reminds me of the predator-prey thing. Uh, we had an interesting case uh, last week. A uh, farmer called us and said that the turkey vultures were killing his calves. And he shows me what we got from dispatch. You know, what do you think of this? And I'm like, that's just crazy talk. These guys just associating with dead calves. These vultures, like, that can't happen. And he showed me an article. Well, why don't you read this before you pass it? This is how I'm trained. He goes, maybe you should read this article right here before you pass it. Sure is. I couldn't believe it. It's actually happened. These black vultures have found a way to start preying on livestock. Uh, what they'll do is still, within the first two weeks of their life, lambs uh, and the cattle, the calves, they'll peck the eyes out so that the calf is disoriented. Then they'll start pulling at the anus and eventually the animal will bleed out and succumb and they'll be able to actually take it. Uh, so this is how learned behavior from black vultures is becoming more and more of a problem. We actually got another call from uh, that those lambs were getting taken by bald eagles, he said. So, and I talked with another officer today and he had a case where they were preying on lambs, but it wasn't the eagles he may have associated. Eagles may have been feeding on something that the vultures took we're guessing, because they've been known to take the lambs now too in this region. So it's interesting to learn behavior and the black vulture population is going up. So this is a problem that's probably going to increase. So it's just something we're starting to observe now. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, I wasn't aware of it. It was news to me. I just thought you guys would find that interesting. Are you allowed to shoot them? No. They are protected. Uh, you can get a depredation permit, but that takes time. So with, through the Department of Agriculture, what we advise them to do is to try to pursue one of those depredation permits. And in short term, they sell these things called uh, vulture effigies. It's a plastic vulture, sewn on feathers, put a post up with the cross beam, and just hang it there by its feet. And it freaks the vultures out. But its wings open, it's a dead vulture. They want nothing to do with it. So many yards of that effigy. And what they encourage you to do is once a depredation permit is issued, if any are harvested, literally hang that live vulture from its feet at that location to show the other vultures and condition them not to prey upon that farm. And it's supposed to work very, very well. But it, you know, it, it requires sacrifice of few. The vultures quickly learn that, nah, that thing was there for quite some time. And they figured out, you know, they're not that dumb. But during like the calving season, it kind of works because it's a small window, like a month or so. If you hung it out there all year, it would be like those coyote silhouettes they put up with the geese feeding around them. Eventually, the birds figure it out. 
but that's pretty much all they can do until the Department of Ag finds a way. Look, we don't have a permit to shoot them. You know, it's it's yeah, it has to all be federally uh, granted. So it's something that's being worked out. Yes. Are all uh, hawks and owls protected? Yes. Yes, they are all protected. Thank you. Yes, we had a guy uh, just call last week. He wanted a permit for an owl. And the only way you can get a permit for an owl is when to take it to tax service. And it was, I guess I can share this information. But it was interesting because when I looked up the officer uh, that worked that district, he was like less than a mile from the house. He was like, I just drove by their house. So I wondered if people see us and they get nervous, oh, I better call about that owl in my fridge. And that had to be what happened. What are the chances, right? You have an owl in your fridge and you call and report it so that we come and get it. So it was kind of funny this week. We joked about it a little bit. But anyway, uh, the only way those permits are actually issued are for educational purposes. Like it has to serve some kind of conservation or educational purpose or to display, you know, like a nature center or something or a school. That's the only way those permits are issued. But they're not to harvest, they're for dead specimens. You know, we have them in freezers and things that we picked up and they can be provided and, and purchased. Yes? you guys ever look at data between trout stocking and the behavior of predatory animals? Like mink? Yeah, do they attract? I'm not aware, I just know that mink are very, very resourceful predators, especially in the hatchery environment. I think in a natural environment, the fish can sustain their population. You know, guys are out there trapping mink. Mink are one of the few furs that are actually worth anything. There are guys that still trap mink, so you don't have a huge population where it would decimate like a wild fishery. But in a hatchery setting, yeah, they can, they can get greedy and very creative and really do some damage. It's more the blue heron than Absolutely. anything else. That's, that's the monster. I mean, you guys have right. all caught the trap that have the scars on them from the heron. Right. I think they, like anything, they probably prey more on the sick. You know, I know they wipe out fish ponds in the winter. Goldfish are nice and slow, easy targets. But other than that, I think the fish has to be compromised to some extent to make it make food because I think they could outswing them with trout could, I think, anyway. Maybe some of those suckers, again, away, why not? But that's okay. Two questions. Sure. How many, how many nesting bald eagles are in the county? And you know, you have trouble with mange and bear in the county. Uh, I can't answer the number because it's been constantly increasing with the bald eagles. Uh, we have a nest right down here on on the river in Winfield. We got one in Mifflinburg by one of the ponds. We got a couple up and down Penns Creek. You know, it, it's just increasing every year. I can tell you that. I, I don't know an exact number. Uh, last year, the mange and the bear that we got reported was just horrible. I think we put down 11 bear last year for the mange. And when it warmed up there in January of this year, after we had our cold snap, the first one came out and we put it down, but we've only done three. So that was, I thought, you know, oh man, one out in January already, we already put one down. I thought it was going to be another huge year. But we have only done three this year. Uh, they are doing a bear study with our biologist. He's collaring bears at, at different rates. He's, you know, uh, following them into the den. He's giving some of them the uh, ivermectin, which can cure it. You know, a, a real big study. And the calls that I had this year, and it wasn't a ton of them, I would say five or six. I passed on to them because we are part of their study area and they were going to try to trap those bears and collar them and monitor them. So uh, we've only put down three this year, but I'm sure we will see some being turned in during the bear season. Just to add to that, like you said, the bald eagle population is growing. It's growing every single year. The numbers stuck in my head, this might not be accurate, but I might just be making this up. I think it was like 200 breeding pairs. Does that sound right to you, Pennsylvania? Actually, it's a lot. It's a big just, number compared to what you see. Every to be. year it, it just jumps and jumps. And people are seeing them in places they've never been before. Like even in suburbia, you know, working down streams and stuff. And it's you know, always more and more sightings of it. But uh, you guys probably know this already, but with the bears and the mange, you know, the agency often hear them say a fed bear is a dead bear. 
Mage is one of the reasons we say that. It's not necessarily it's a nuisance bear that we're going to put down. When bears touch, that's how mage spreads. You know, rubs up on something, they share a feeding location. This is a big reason why we discourage feeding. Because one mage bear infects the others that feed at that location. That's how the parasite is spread. It doesn't persist well in the environment. Like mange, the, uh, the mite that causes it, in less than a week it's dead. It's not like a lot of other diseases that would persist or insects. It, it actively needs to, to have that host animal. So it's these direct interactions is how it's spread. So if that's discouraged, that's the only way we're ever going to get a handle on mange. You know, you have to have less bears, and you have less bears interacting closely with each other, especially in a feeding environment. Just outside of Mifflinburg, some time ago, there were several eagles not just out beyond the VFW there, feeding in a field. I'm pretty sure they were feeding on dead chickens. What's the deal? Evidently, something killed the chickens. Or they be so what, what, what the deal is with that is, uh, and you guys should be all very familiar, the Mennonite community are expanding their chicken houses just like the eagles are expanding. <clears throat> so when they're cleaning out their chicken houses, that is one of their dump sites for the dead chickens that when they're cleaning the map. And that's why all the eagles are congregating there, because when they wow. clean the house and they go to dump their chickens. I sit up in the hill and watch them a lot. You know, the interactions between the eagles and stuff like that. So that's that's where it's coming from. But evidently there's something killed the chickens for them to get no, out there. No, they're, no, they're, they're, they're dumping them for their chicken houses. Yeah, you, know, you know the big long the chicken houses they have now, Bob? It's the dead ones that they find in the house. The dead ones that they find in the house. Well, what's killing the dead ones in the house? I guess that's my question. No, they're just that's two percent loss is normal in chicken yeah, houses. Two to five percent. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a normal population loss in those chicken houses that happens. I mean, you know, if you ever had chickens, you'll see uh, for some reason some of them are just not in the in group, and they peck them and peck them and peck them until they die. It's that, it's, it's that simple. So they just take them out and throw them in the field for decomposition, for fertilizer. They're going to grind it in. And that's where the eagles come in there. Yeah, that's bad. Two weeks ago, I was driving behind Mifflinburg. The eagle had a dead possum on the roof. Hmm. First time I've ever seen it. Wow, it was carrying it away. Big possum? Little? A fairly good size. Wow, I mean, he had trouble getting it out of the middle of the road off to the edge of the road. Wow. As I, was <laughs> and I slowed down, stopped, got the well, camera. That's pretty neat. And, and, that, and that's one thing you see, you know, you, you see, you've you seen that, Bob's seen it, a lot of people have seen these eagles, you know, and here's our majestic American symbol <clears throat> is a scavenger. Okay, they're, they're primarily a scavenger. I actually haven't heard that. That's, that's pretty neat. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. You have nothing else for me. Oh, no? No. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. It was a really good for me. Thank you. About his score after the oh, yeah yeah you know, the scorecards I have to that I do have before we go one thing uh, and this is on our through the email and, and stuff trout in the classroom eggs food and egg packing events some people like to help with that October thirty first. From 10 till 12:30 at the Regional Fish Commission office over in Belfont. That's October 31st, 10 to 12:30, and that's the food packing. The egg packing is then November 6th, from 9 to 12 at the regional office. So anybody that's interested in going over and helping them pack food and pack the eggs for the Trout in the Classroom project, why uh, show up at Belfont? The tunnel's closed. Pardon? The tunnel is closed or something? Uh, the debris. The tunnel is. <clears throat> the tunnel isn't closed. Uh, the, the bridge. The, the bridge. There's debris against the bridge. 
This is up in, I guess it's Center County now, <coughs> up above the railroad grade up along Pass Creek. Uh, if you go through the tunnel, there's the, the old railroad bridge goes across the creek. Uh, there's debris up against the bridge, and I think the worry is for canoeists coming down the river getting getting trapped. So uh, there, Matt Beaver, whom we've had here, the district forester, was getting people into to try to clear the debris away from the bridge to make it safe. I don't know if that's happened yet. I've not talked to Matt in the last couple of days. So be wary. <clears throat> this year, with all the high water, if you're a canoeist, you want to be wary where you go because there's lots of trees in the creeks. Uh, anything else for a goody order? Okay, thank you very much thank for you. coming. We'll see you next month.